video three of chapter 10. We're going to be looking at the hypotheses testing or significance testing for a difference in two proportions. So in video two, we talked about the difference uh, in two proportions in a confidence interval. And now we're going to talk about some significance testing like we did back in chapter nine. Now, our null hypothesis is typically going to be that we would expect to see a zero difference, that there would be no difference between our two population proportions. Now, does that mean that there's always going to be a zero difference between our two populations? Not necessarily, um, but typically we're looking for a general difference between two populations. And so if we're just leaving it as that, then we're always going to have the, the null and the alternate hypotheses to use uh, zero specifically. But if for whatever reason there was some other value that they have to specify um, where they may say like it's always been known in previous experiences that there's always a 10% difference or a 20% difference or whatever the case may be, but they would have to specify what a natural difference would be for a particular problem. So you can write your null and alternate hypotheses one of two ways as a difference like here or really if we're saying that there's no difference, that there's a zero difference between these two groups, well, really we're saying that uh, the two population proportions for our two samples, uh, for our two populations, I mean, uh, would be equal to each other, okay? But really these are mathematically the same, right? If I subtract this P2 over to this P1, then we're really saying that there is a difference of zero. So either way is acceptable. Just also make sure that you define uh, what is P1 and what is P2 in that case? Now, last chapter, when we did um, significance tests or hypothesis testing for one sample proportion, we used this formula. And our formula was our test statistic, Z, is equal to our statistic, P hat, minus our parameter, our hypothesized parameter value that came from our null and alternate hypothesis divided by our standard error or our standard deviation of the test statistic. Now, for two samples, everything's basically going to get doubled in size, if you will. So now instead of looking at just one sample, we're going to be looking at the difference of our two samples. So in these problems, I'm going to have to give you, like in the last video with uh, difference in uh, confidence interval of two proportions, I have to give you these specific values or you have to put them together. And, you know, if I said 34 out of 100 people, well, 34 out of 100 or 0.34 is one sample proportion. And then we're still looking at our hypothesized difference, which again, for the most part, this is going to be zero. This will be kind of nice because back in chapter nine, um, there wasn't always a hypothesized zero value. It could have been whatever the problem specified. So again, this is usually going to be a zero difference here. Now the one kind of new aspect of this is going to come down here in the denominator. And we're going to see this used somewhere else uh, as well in this video. But notice that I've got p hat sub c. And what I mean by that is this p hat sub c noticed is used in both of these standard errors. And the c represents a combined kind of standard error, if you will, a combined p hat. It's not really the average, it's more like a weighted average. So we're going to add together our total number of successes that we have between our two samples and divide that by our total uh, two sample sizes. All right. So it's not really the average, it's more of a weighted average, if you will. All right. And it's going to be that one number that we get to use four times down here in the denominator. So again, that's going to be a new idea. We haven't done this, and we didn't do this in the last video. Uh, and the only reason why we do this in this video versus the last video and with the confidence intervals is all because of our null hypothesis. We're assuming under the null hypothesis that our two population proportions are uh, equal to each other. And that's not really an assumption that we make with confidence intervals. We don't know anything about our two population proportions when we do a confidence interval problem. So because we're assuming that we have equal population proportions, then that's why we're going to uh, combine our two sample proportions and get kind of more of a weighted average. Now, another term that you may see this, instead of a combined 
um, sample proportion is they also refer to this as a pooled estimate as a pooled estimate for p hat uh, and I believe on the AP formula sheet they refer to it as a pooled estimate but it's only going to be for proportion problems will we use a pooled estimate for mean problems when we get there we're not going to do this same idea for mean problems all right conditions are pretty much going to be exactly the same as they were for confidence intervals we still need to check that each sample was randomly selected from the population um, our independent condition we still have to check twice for each population whether hopefully there are two separate populations to consider uh, but if not then you could kind of reference the one population twice and the normal condition this is where the one little difference is going to come into play we're going to use that pooled estimate for all four of the n times p and n times one minus p checks okay so it's going to be first sample size times the pooled sample proportion and then the first sample size times one minus the pooled sample proportion and then likewise with the second sample so there's going to be two places where we're going to use that pooled estimate and that's in the normal check and we're also going to use it down here in the standard error of our test statistic formula so two places you get to use that two for one all right so here's the example we're going to look at it says high levels of cholesterol in blood uh, are associated with higher risk of heart attacks will using a drug to lower blood cholesterol reduce heart attacks the Helsinki Heart Study looked at this question. Middle-aged men were assigned at random to one of two treatments. 2,051 men took the drug Jim for Brizzle to reduce their cholesterol levels, and a control group of 2,030 men took a placebo. Uh, first, is it is it okay that we have two different sample sizes? It is. It's okay. Ideally, you'd want to have equal sample sizes, but these are pretty close enough. So don't fret about that if that's the first thing you notice there. Uh, during the next five years, 56 men in the Jim for Brizzle group and 84, 84 men in the placebo group had heart attacks. Is the apparent benefit of Jim for Brizzle statistically significant? So here I'm just kind of organizing my, uh, my information so far. So I've got my two sample sizes here and I have my sample proportions of people that had heart attacks after five years. So I also, I, I immediately notice here that in my uh, treatment group with the Jim for Brizzle, uh, is it really called Jim for Brizzle? I don't know. It just kind of flows nicely off the tongue there. So Jim for Brizzle. Um, I can see that a little under 3% of patients had a heart attack versus those that didn't take Jim for Brizzle and they just took a placebo. Uh, it was a little over 4%. Now, this about percent and a half difference here, is that statistically significant? So that's what we're going to find out with our test. So first stating our null and alternate hypotheses. And so notice I called kind of group one, my treatment group, the Jim for Brizzle group, and group two, I called the placebo group. Now, if you wanted to flip flop those around, that's perfectly fine. So as I stated my null and alternate hypotheses, um, I would expect hopefully if Jim for Brizzle is um, if it really does help reduce the number of heart attacks in men then I would expect the placebo group to have a higher rate of heart attacks than my group that had the actual treatment of Jim for Brizzle Don't you guys love how I keep saying Jim for Brizzle it's gonna be like the word of the video Jim for Brizzle Jim for Brizzle uh, so I would expect this to be a higher number this to be a smaller number and so when I especially look at my alternate if I'm taking a bigger number minus a smaller number, then I expect to see positive differences. Now, I also have here, if you flip it around and you look at the Jim for Brizzle group, Jim for Brizzle, Jim for Brizzle, uh, and I subtract away the placebo group, then this, again, represents smaller values, smaller proportions, minus a larger proportion, then, alternatively, I would expect negative differences. So does it really matter which one of these two hypotheses that I write out? And it doesn't matter. It's going to lead me to the same p-value in the end. Now, I typically like to write my differences as positive differences. Uh, just they sound more pleasing to have positive differences than negative differences. But notice whenever I define what p 
uh, 2 minus P1 is, I am saying it's the difference in my Jim Fabrizel minus placebo group here. Or really, I guess I should say it's my placebo. I guess I should flip those around, right? It's placebo minus Jim Fabrizel. Uh, Jim Fabrizel minus placebo, Jim Fabrizel, Jim Fabrizel. <laughs> this is getting to be too hysterical. I know you guys are like, oh my god, just shut up. Um, this would be what I would use if I was doing P1 minus P2. So I apologize for that. If you would flip-flop placebo and Jim Fabrizel, that would be technically how I set up P2 minus P1. So there are my hypotheses and defining my parameter of interest. All right, my conditions. Do I have uh, random samples? And it doesn't say that the men were randomly selected, and for a medical experiment, you can't really randomly select people from the population. Um, this isn't like Nazi Germany where we're going to make people be a part of experiments. So we have to deal with um, people who are volunteering themselves. They are uh, not randomly selected. But it did say that the men were assigned at random to one of the two treatment groups. So that is as good as we can get it. All right, the independent condition. We got to check our two populations here. So we got to consider all middle-aged men and really all middle-aged men. They were both kind of taken from the same population. And so really in the end, we only have to, I mean, this is the more important one here that could be broken. Uh, but still, I would say that is safely going to be met here, that we definitely have over 20,510 middle-aged men. Now, if you only listed this once and you picked the higher sample size, then you could really kind of get away with only doing this once. But you do need to specify that the populations for both groups are technically from the same group altogether, the same population. All right, the normal condition. This is where we needed to use that new pooled estimate. So notice here, here's my p hat sub c. I had 56 men get a heart attack with Jim Fabrizel, 84 men had a heart attack with the placebo group, so I combine all those, and if you want to get like this one giant fraction here, let's see, I had 140 people all together have a heart attack, regardless if they were on Jim Fabrizel or not on Jim Fabrizel, out of a total of 4,081 men. So. 140 out of 4,081 altogether, rounded that off, gives me a little under 3.5%, 3.43%. And that's the number that I'm going to use for all four of these conditions. So checking all of these, and I find that the lowest such number is 69.63, which is greater than or equal to 10. So if you want to show all of these, you can, or if you can state uh, that this specific one out of the four would produce the smallest value uh, to compare to 10, then you could just do that. But you kind of have to think ahead in advance which number is really going to be the smallest. So I would personally just recommend showing all of them. Nope, oh, did something disappear there? Hold up, let me go back. Boop, come on, there we go. So since all of those are met, then in the end, we may state our sampling distribution is approximately normal. And now we may proceed on. So to the calculations, we have this lovely new uh, test statistic here. And you'll notice that I kind of left off a part of it. Uh, really, this was the very first part here, the difference of our two sample proportions. Uh, but then I left off the P2 minus P1. Now, what value, where did that go? There we go. Uh, what value does P2 minus P1 take? Well, that was our hypothesized difference, which was zero. So you can see why here that maybe why I left that off specifically, because really we're taking this and we're subtracting nothing. So do we really need to write it there? I, I would kind of argue yes and no for those taking the AP exam. I would go ahead and do P2 minus P1 there, just to show that you know that we're taking the statistic minus the parameter divided by the standard error of the statistic. 
And so once I plug in all of my wonderful numbers here, including making sure to use my pooled estimate downstairs here in the denominator, I get a test statistic of 2.475. And converting that test statistic to a p-value, and since I'm already with a positive test statistic, then I want to go even further away uh, from a zero test statistic. So lower bound, upper bound, do, where am I at here? Lower bound, upper bound, no degrees of freedom with proportion problems. Remember, that's only for our mean problems. And I get a p-value of 0 0.006662. So now for my conclusion. Since my p-value is smaller than an alpha of 0.05, we should reject the null hypothesis. And if we reject the null hypothesis, then we do have enough evidence at the alpha equals 0.05 level to conclude the middle-aged men who took Jim for Brizzle had fewer heart attacks than those men who took a placebo. Now, keep in mind that um, since our men were not randomly selected, then the results of this experiment only apply to the men that were in the study. So notice that I said here to conclude the middle-aged men who took Jim for Bristle had fewer heart attacks than those men who took a placebo. I'm not saying that this is true for all middle-aged men who could take Jim for Bristle and had fewer heart attacks than all men who would take a placebo or not take Jim for Bristle. Um, so just keep that in mind in terms of who do the results apply to. Now, the 95% confidence interval is this, and does this support our conclusion from above? And so if I give you the confidence interval here, and you might go, um, what number are we looking for? And this represents the difference in the population proportions. And remember, if there is no difference, then we should expect to see a zero difference in our confidence interval. But zero is not contained in this confidence interval. So it is true that since zero is not in the confidence interval, then we would still reject the null hypothesis, meaning that there is not a zero difference, uh, that there is a statistically significant result here. And so Jim for Brizzle is the Jim for Brizzle of heart attack medicine. That's going to be a new word. You guys can use it, Jim for Brizzle. Now, I have one last question here that I want you guys to try out, and we'll go over it the next day in class. Um, and so notice in this computer output, I just want to kind of explain this real quick, that in, here are your two sample sizes, 61 and 62, and the X here in both of these cases represent the number of successes, whatever successes are considered. So I'm going to put successes in quotations. Uh, because the success sometimes isn't really, you know, something you would consider a success. All right, so I will let you guys try that one out, and we'll discuss it again the next day in class. Good luck.